everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Dan McQueen's story is a testament to the power of one's will. He's had not one, but two brain injuries. From living in a coma to learning to talk and walk again. His story is one that has power for all of us. It's a story of baby steps, accomplishment, and resilience. Please welcome Dan McQueen to Bump in the Road. Dan, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, tell us your story. Hi, Pat. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. My story takes place in jolly old London, England in 2014. Uh, Before this happened, I was a healthy, active 28-year-old guy living, working in London, big nights out, traveling around Europe on my weekends. The weekend before this, I was in Lithuania. Started having these headaches that were horrible, and they got worse after a few weeks. I was taking painkillers like candy for those. My head was pounding. The headaches would get so bad, my vision turned spotty, and I would see stars just go black. Black, like blinding headaches. I was in the tube one day. The tube tell you to get around London, going to Notting Hill Gate Station. And the headaches were so strong, so profound, my vision started to go. Slow at first, and then fits and starts. As I creeped towards Nine Hill Gate Station, the, the vision was going. I stepped onto the platform, behind the gap, and the curtain fell. I couldn't see. Now, I want to ask you and your listeners, Pat, as an able-sighted person your whole life, what would you do in that situation? Totally freak out. Um, I would be terrified. And my God, you're just all of a sudden so dependent on the kindness of strangers. So I'll tell you what I did, Pat. I did absolutely nothing. I just thought. I was thinking. I was still thinking through the process. What am I going to do here? And the vision came back, luckily. But I realized that this is not a casual thing that I'm dealing with. So I went back to Annie the next day. And again, they thought it was vertigo. They sent me home. But they told me on the way out, I could always get my eyes checked in an optometrist, right? An optometrist, you say, that's kind of an odd thing, but I guess, you know, I'm not going to be uh, nitpicking their solutions here. Next day, the headaches came back with a vengeance, and I found myself in Mr. Patel's chair. He was midway through a routine exam when he stops the exam. He excuses himself from the room, and he comes back with a sealed envelope, which he gives to me. He tells me to go directly to Moorfield's hospital, which I did. Well, Pat... I'll be honest with you, tell a lie. I stopped at home first to grab a Jack Reacher book by Lee Child, a phone charger and a bite to eat, and then I went to Moorfields Hospital. I handed them the envelope, and they ran the same test there. Then that slowed me up to Charing Cross Hospital. We're getting somewhere, I'm thinking. Turns out, I had a dangerous build of pressure in my brain caused from my cancer, non-cancerous cyst in my penina gland in my brain that prevented the fluid from my brain drain as it normally would. Turns out, I required emergency brain surgery tomorrow. It turns out my world's about to change altogether. After a frantic back and forth with the folks in Canada, the last text message I read by mom reads, I'll see you soon, mom. I think I'll have a new haircut next time I see you. Love down. Mom was in the air flying to London on June 21st, 2014. I was on the operating table. Something went horribly wrong. And I have a massive bleed in the brain, a brain hemorrhage. Then the cyst burst when they operated. Mom lands and finds I'm in critical condition. I was in a coma for four weeks, but was in and out of consciousness for months after this. Things were dicey, touch and go. When all was said and done, I was learning how to walk, talk, and smile again, Pat. And that's where things kind of kick off four weeks later for me. I I think we were talking about this before we started the podcast. I mean, for me, my brain is probably my most valued organ. Um, I can't even imagine the terror of going through that. And the only thing I can think of in terms of recovery would be it's all about survival. It is simply one foot, we'll put one step at a time with the hope that this is going to come together. Yeah, that's 100% correct. 
I've got all these whimsical stories and like perspective now that I've kind of adapted after years of recovery. But in the moment, at the point of contact, you're worried about surviving. You're worried about the next step. You're worried about like getting it through that day, that hour, that evening. And like, everyone's like, well, how do you, how do you, how do you go forward? I'm like, well, how do you not? Like, how do you not fight? And at the moment of contact though, I want you to be very clear. Like this is about surviving and getting through this acute angle, not worrying about like, what's the lesson here? What's the, how, how am I going to mindset this? It's like, it's like, how do I breathe again? How do I fight for the next day? So it's very key for that. It's a good observation, Pat. What were some of the um, physical issues you were dealing with? Did, did you have a lot of rehab involved in this? Oh, for about a year. So I woke up from the hospital with my dad, mom and brother on the bed. I couldn't talk, but I'm trying to talk because my tracheotomy had muffled up my uh, vocal cords. I'll tell you a bit more about that in just a second. But I pointed at my brother and I go, you, give me a pen and paper. Which I'm sure they're relieved to know that I could still function and write. So we're in the pen and paper. I go, get me out of here. And I show it to Cam. And I point at him and I go, you. Make this happen, bud. He's just like, what am I supposed to do, bud? You're hooked up to tubes and hoses. Your one eye is wonky as hell. You know, you're you're going nowhere. I was in the hospital for months after this, but like, I couldn't talk, right? The way the nurse got me talking again, took a few weeks, was she took me down to the park. So I'm wheelchair bound, can't speak, can't talk, can't smile. She took me down to the park and she sits me in front of these guys playing football across the park, soccer across the park. And she goes, Dan, those kids across the park, they don't think you're good enough to talk, Dan. They don't think you're good enough to talk. Which I found out pretty quickly is a big motivator for me. And I yelled some profanities across the park. I'll spell you and your listeners. But like, let's just say that that pushed a button that I didn't know existed. <laughs> I'm a big sportsman. Like, I grew up playing sports. And I think that she found it up with my parents. So she pushed the button that made that work. And man, she was trying to make me talk. She made me sing. Like, I was, I was spurred on to to rise up to this challenge and to be told that I'm not good enough was just the ticket I need to get going off the edge. But I was in a bad way. Like I couldn't walk, talk, or smile. The talking came back. The walking was, you know, a bit more of an arduous journey that took months. Like I was in a wheelchair for probably four months and I had to wear a splint over my left leg to get the leg to stretch out. So the leg had frozen an angle when I was in a coma and atrophied. So we were a splint one hour a night to kind of stretch out the leg muscle. Now, the first night I wore the splint through the night, no issue, no stress. This will be easy, I thought. This will be easy. Boy, was I wrong. The second night, after 20 minutes, it was painful. After 30 minutes, it was dreadful. After 40 minutes, it was unbearable. I buzzed the nurse. They took the splint off my leg. But I tell them on the way out, tomorrow we're doing this for an hour. I'm a walker. I can handle the pain. Big talk, bud. Big talk. The third night, they wrap up my leg. They give me the clicker, the nurse call button. They go patrol the Wolfson ward. Now, the Wolfson ward was an L shape, so short on this side, long on this side, okay? Short on this side, long on this side. And they leave me in that hospital room that smells like only a hospital room can smell. Sanitized, sterilized. It's clean, but you wonder what sort of atrocity has been committed under the guise of this lemony zestness in this room. After 10 minutes, the leg's painful. After 20 minutes, the leg's dreadful. After 30 minutes, the leg's unbearable. I start passing a clicker back and forth, trying to distract myself from the pain. Now, Pat, I've got double vision from the brain dream, which means I get the pleasure of seeing two of you. Well, just one now because I'm on the eye patch today. But I wasn't on the eye patch during this, this, this leg splint era. So the clicker's going back and forth. And as the pain ratchets up, my throat's get more enthusiastic. Till eventually, inevitably, I drop the clicker and it lands on the hard little on the floor. Three and a half feet down the ground. Sugar, I say. I look over the edge of the bed. I see the clicker there lying on the floor looking back at me. If I can only get to that clicker, I can end this pain. I can stop this, this monstrosity on my leg. It's the most painful thing I've experienced in my life. It's like a rat's nest just expanding my volume. And like every second is like magnifying the, the pain. So I look over the edge of the bed. I see the clicker there on the floor. If I can get to that clicker, I can stop the pain. But it's, it's, it's such a hard fall on the little room floor. I thought it would be a 50-50 chance of me breaking my arm. A coin flip. Not the best odds. I changed tack. I'm trying to do the split, but it's not at the ankle, not at the hip. I'm not that flexible. I can't reach that far down. Help. Help, I yell. The war of the wolves was an L-shape, right? Short on this side, long on this side. Short on this side, long on this side. They're at the far end of the ward. They can't even have 
I decided to flip the coin. Drop down and grab the clicker, even if I break my arm. This is the most important thing in my vibe right now. Lower myself off the edge of the bed, and I crash down in a heap. It's, it's a yard sale. Blankets, wires, cables is all I go. The arm holds, and I hammer the clicker, expecting the nurses to come bursting into the room to come and rescue. They kind of stroll in five minutes later, waiting on the flow of love. They say in their British accents, I say, let's not worry about it. Let's see the splint off my leg. Please don't tell you all about this. It's not what happens to you, but how you respond to the matters, right? The reason why I'm telling you the story is I learned three lessons from the experience. The first is let's not pass the clicker back and forth. <laughs> it's a pretty self-evident lesson, but you know, sometimes it takes us to touch the stove and know it's hot. The second was let's do the splint up at the hip, not the ankle. That way I can undo this should this happen going forwards. And the third and probably most profound was let's always be solutions oriented from this one forwards going forwards. When things go sideways, they inevitably will. At the moment of contact, how do you fix your problem then and there? At the end, at that, that moment of contact, when the clicker fell, that was the most important thing in my world. The arm breaking, and so be it. This splint has got to come on my leg now. And that focus and that drive is like ingrained in me now when I when I focus on something that's what I want to do. With the help of the splint, I was start walking the with the Wilson, but this is a slow roll. I was using the, the, the Zimmer frame. Then I moved up to the Ferrari, which is a four-wheeled walk you can kind of waddle around quickly on. Calling the Ferrari because it's in Ferrari racing red and I was going fast in a walker. Nothing fun here. Then I moved to naked walks. Now what's a naked walk to ask, Pat? Well, just walking without sport or aids. I was walking naked. The term kind of stuck. It was long road down to the naked walks, but man, I was just happy to move it. Then came time to walk in Tune Broadway. The story I'd love to share with your group. Have you been to London, England, Pat? Yes. Have you been to Tune Broadway? I don't believe so. All right. Well, let me set the scene for you and your audience. Tune Broadway is an area in South London, an area they call up and coming. Think loud sirens, drugs, gangs. It's dirty, it's hectic, and boys are busy. I'm walking with a cane, I'm walking with an eye patch. After four months in a wheelchair, I'm literally bambi on ice. I turn the corner to walk on the high street for the first time, immediately get slammed into by someone. I stagger back a few feet. Someone scurries past me on the right-hand side. I thought I was done with the rats. Someone had been stabbed on the sidewalk over here. I'm thinking, this is a pretty wild place in her walk. After a few days of this, I was thinking, this is the worst place in her walk in the world. Can't they see I'm trying to walk here? Can't they see I'm trying here? Isn't it amazing, though? People don't really notice, do they? No, not at all. I, I think that's day, one of the things that comes out of any sort of um, encounter with illness is that you are very much on your own. And I think the point that you bring up, that you had focus and drive, had to be a big piece of what got you through this. Oh, for sure. It was, uh, I did these tests a little while ago last year, Pat, at this brain injury clinic in, uh, in Vancouver. And it's like, they're quite big and like brain scans. And, you know, I was getting my brain scanned because it's, you know, two traumatic brain injuries. Um, let's see what the scan say. And I went for the test. They put like this cap on your head and they, they read out words like cat, dog, cucumber, onion, and they kind of link to see what, what resonates in your mind is connected words and they track how you swore. My results came back as average, right? Two brain injuries, average. I'm like, you know, that's not bad, but I read it as shockingly average. Because I've recovered so well, I would have thought it would be big outliers, big outliers in my recovery yeah. vibe, right? So I thought about this for a little while, and then I thought more about this, and I realized, you know what, that's actually a really good thing, because that means that my recovery, my rehab, my my recovery has been result of drive, mindset, and perspective, and like resilience above what? anything else. I'm no smarter or better than anyone else on this call or that I speak with. It's just like I've just driven to go forward, and I'm choosing to do that every day of the week. And that just means that you can do this too, which means like, this is not to say what I've done, but to show what you can do if you just put your mindset to it, right? Which is quite key. So resilience and drive are huge for this, Pat. Thank you. Yeah. um, You had had a second brain injury. Briefly, tell us about that. I mean, I I can't imagine getting through one, but two? Yeah. So, you know, this, this walking took five months to get back to walking and then I was... 
I had to work for about a year. I worked for I used to work for Hootsuite, a social media management company. And I would do occupational therapy, vocational therapy, speech and language therapy, physical therapy. Like I built myself back up for six months out of the hospital at home doing rehab. Finally got back to work, you know, two half days a week, three half days a week. And I meet my mom with the two before I went to the office. Is a way to kind of showcase that I go off on time and that you go off on our walk in London. This is a Goldock Road tube station, for those that know, on the Hammersmith City line. One day I didn't show up at the tube. And my mom calls me, no response. She goes back to my flowers about five minutes away, Salgrave Road. And she finds me unconscious on the floor. She calls 999 and I get rushed off to the hospital, have emergency brain surgery. I wake up the next day to hear the beeping noise of the heart rate monitor going off behind me, you know, beep, beep. Beep. What happened? What happened? What happened? Well, Dan, you had a second brain injury. What do you mean? I had something called hydrocephalus or water on the brain. I have a shunt in my brain from the first brain injury, which had blocked leading to hydrocephalus. So apparently, this is very rare and happens in less than 10% of cases. So, the lucky me, this is very helpful. But this so, was, I described my recovery like a W, right, Pat? So, the first setback was the first drop of the W. Mm-hmm. The second, you know, I climbed back up to work about halfway up the top of the W. The second setback is not where the first one was much lower. I call this the depths of the human experience. Where your hopes and dreams get snickered at. You know, you thought you had a chance there, but huh? Back to work all you you almost left this all behind us and how we brought you back in. What did it take to de- rededicate yourself to coming back from something like this? I mean, doing it once is astonishing. On the second time, is it, it was it tempting to give up at some point? I made the choice early on. I'm not going to. I'm not going to give up and let this win. I'm going to. If I'm going to fail, it's because I'm not good enough to win. But I'm not going to throw in the towel and let this beat me. Like the sake of saying, I'm not going to try anymore. So it was very much a mental game, and you know, it was very dark, Pat. It was very dark, and it took a long time to get my head around this, and really solidify my mindset of it's not what happens to you, but how you respond to the matters. You know, the second setback happened and it knocked me, it knocked me for six, right? Like I was, I was, I was devastated. I already had rehab, so I wasn't able to go back to in-person rehab. I had to do this uh, vocation, um, uh, remotely. I'm not going to fight tooth and nail to get that sorted out. But it took a long time to get my head around this and to like make my peace with it. And, you know, the first setback took probably two months. The second setback took about a month to get my head around this. And then I avoided the pity spiral and just decided, you know what, it's not what happens to you, but how you respond to the matters. And it was a mental game at this stage. But the, the benefit of this was I knew how to rehab and I could build back up faster and better because I made some mistakes the first time around. It was a bit slower than I could have been. So I hit the ground running with a new fever, new, new, new perspective, new mindset, new um, drive. And I clambered back up and I was not going to throw in the towel for this. So like it's... So much of this is a mental game. As you mentioned, like the brain's the most important thing. Like, yeah, it's the most important thing. But like, it's what you think about it that matters. It's not what happens to you, but how you respond to it that matters. And that's an Epictetus quote from uh, an old Stoic philosopher, someone I've read into lots. But again, at the time of moment of contact, you're not getting all philosophical about this. You're worried about like the next step. But yeah, this was a difficult next step to take, Pat, for sure. How did this change your values? Oh, it's changed them dramatically. Like I, I've got ride or die stuff now that I do and I don't do. I used to be, I wasn't a bad guy before this Pat, but I wasn't as steadfast with my values and perspective and who I am as a person that I am now. Now I'm like, I don't do these things. I do these things. And I'm that person that does these set things. And that's ingrained in me through like, through re- repetitive use and, 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 and mindset. But it's changed my whole look on life. Like uh, it's 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 just dramatically shifted my perspective, my values, and what I'm trying to do in this world. Like even even going into recovery, like initially I was motivated by proving people wrong, right? That that you're not good enough to talk. Like I want to prove you wrong. Let me show you what's wrong. Now I've transitioned that to more service, lending a hand, helping you see the way through. Because when your success is my success, it doesn't end when the conversation ends. When it's I'm not good enough to be here. I want to prove you wrong. Once I prove you wrong, which don't disrespect Pat, but I will, the the motivation disappears like that. And I want my motivation to carry through long tail. So I'm trying to like make myself a better person and helping you 
help me help you kind of vibe, right? Does that make sense? That's a really important point. I think that when we are against something, it, it just as you say, it has limited longevity. Um, Bernie Siegel, I don't know if you know who he is. Um, he was an, uh, an oncologist at Yale who back in the 80s or so was really into holistic medicine, mind-body connections and things like that. Sure. And everyone joked that Bernie's patients did better than anyone else's. But he was really ridiculed by the mainstream medical establishment. Um, but Bernie told me a story once, and it's always stuck with me. He, um, I had a website called Anti-Cancer Club, partly an homage to David Servan Schreiber, who wrote an amazing book, Anti-Cancer, A New Way of Life. And his story is is amazing, but I'll leave that off for now. Um, anyway, Bernie said to me, you know, you have the wrong name for your website. And I said, why? And he told me a story. He said, Mother Teresa was once uh, asked to go to an anti-war rally, and she declined. And when asked why, she said, have a pro-peace rally. That I'll attend. And that sounds like such a simple story, but it is so incredibly profound. Are you against something or for something? And what is the difference in energy that goes into that type of approach? Yeah, it's uh, this mindset shift again, learned after going through it. I wasn't at the start thinking like, oh, I'm going to be this great holistic service oriented guy. But I realized like after going through the proving you wrong, the anti thing, it like really kind of poisoned the well and it, you know, resentment and, and anger and bitterness is something that poisons the vessel that holds it. Not, you're not going to like impact anyone else by this. You're just poisoning yourself. So I realized like I got to be of service and add value here. And that's what I'm trying to do with my life now. I'm a speaker and I'm trying to go around and shift perspectives. Like I'm going to change the way you look at the world. Right. Which isn't like, as crazy as it sounds, because I'm not trying to change the world. I'm trying to change the way you look at it and show you like, is it like this or like this? Maybe it's like this, but let me show you my story and let me make your own mind up about this, right? Like by shifting your perspective, you can do huge things. When you change the way you look at the world, right? The world look at changes. That's what it's all about. Tell me, did you? That's your- what it's actually all about. Like if you can get that in your head, like it's a mental game. And when you change the way you look at something, you can change the actual outcome of your life. How did um, your perception of people change going through all this, or did it? Uh, people are inherently very good. They're very uh, generous and helpful. They want to see you succeed. But I've also stress tested that too. Like I've been up against a few times where, like, I'm, you know, had some arguments, and you know, being a brain injured guy, like you've got some limitations and some liabilities and some blind spots, and like I've definitely noticed that as well. But it's kind of helped me find the strength in myself to stand up for myself and be my best self and be a man. Um, so you've learned a whole myriad of stuff. and But for the most part, everyone's been very good and generous to me. If you were to give somebody advice facing some sort of traumatic injury that really changes your life, what two or three things would you tell them? It's not what happens to you, but how you respond to it that matters. Control the controllables. And the way out is through those three things. And you get yourself a recipe for success. If you believe those to your core, you'll be able to overcome anything you're facing. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll support this podcast by becoming a bump to subscriber. Buy us a cup of coffee. It's your support that makes this podcast and website possible. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life.